This shows me my VFR visibility and cloud separation requirements. Okay. Class alpha, none. None for class alpha, Vlad. It's not possible. It's not possible. I'm never going to be VFR up there. Awesome. Class Bravo, I could be VFR in Class Bravo. It requires a clearance. I have to be cleared to enter that airspace. I don't have to be cleared to enter Class Charlie. I don't have to be cleared to enter Class Delta. I have to talk to these people and they talk to me. That's two-way communication. Class Bravo requires a clearance. Three statute mile visibility and clear of clouds. I absolutely need to remain clear of clouds. I can get as close as I want, but not in it. Class Charlie Delta Echo. Okay, let's talk Echo below 10,000 feet. Three statute miles, 500 feet below, 1,000 above, 2,000 feet horizontal. Okay. Once we go above 10,000, that scenario that I was just talking about, other airplanes are in a climb and they're faster than 250. Okay. So if I'm flying my Skyhawk at 12,000 feet, it's not... It's not impossible, in fact, it is very possible that I could have a 737 or an Airbus faster than 250 knots in a climb as it comes past me. If I'm VFR, they probably are not. They probably are in contact with ATC, although it could be a business jet flying VFR above 10,000 feet. There are flight tests. I guess it could be a Part 91 leg in one of these other ones, too. But they could be VFR on a flight test or whatever they're doing and passing me climbing above 250 knots. So it requires that we have a minimum of five statute mile visibility. Airplanes are moving faster. So I need more visibility so that there's more time to see and avoid. And I have to maintain 1,000 feet below, 1,000 feet above, and one full statute mile horizontal distance from that cloud instead of 2,000. Well, it's about two and a half times as much because it's just 5,280 feet. Boy, oh boy, look at all this. Class, uh, class echo was just two. It was just one, which is normal, like everything else. That's what we'll call normal, I suppose. One exception, once airplanes start going faster, but then class golf gets crazy. That's my definition of crazy. Let's break it down. Let's make this super, super simple. Class golf below 10,000 feet. So in other words, this area here, I'm somewhere below 10,000 feet. And uh, more than 1,200 feet. So I'm somewhere below 10,000 feet. It changes between day and night. Because above 10,000 feet, guess what? Same, same rules. I'm in controlled airspace and I'm above 10,000 feet. There's no restriction on civil airplanes any longer. They can fly as fast as they're certified to fly. So I need to have five statute miles and still that same thing. This one makes it kind of nice. Class Echo above 10,000, Class Golf above 10,000, they're the same. The other two separate them now into day and night. <clears throat> day, night, day, night. Daytime is one statute mile. Remember, what's Class Golf airspace? Uncontrolled, Uncontrolled. right? So separate it into day and night. Uncontrolled airspace, all I need is one statute mile visibility. This is not a lot. And if I'm below 1,200 feet AGL, I can operate that airplane just clear of clouds, as close as possible to that cloud, close as I want to be, but just not in it. Okay. Nighttime. Nighttime's always three. And any other situation except for this one main, means I have to have 500 feet below, 1,000 above, and 2,000 feet horizontal. So when I look at this from a 
common sense perspective. And that, that's what I was trying to do. I, I spent the better part of probably six, seven years getting this thing really refined. My first two years trying to teach this topic, the VFR uh, visibility and cloud separation requirement, I would put it on a board. There's a gentleman that has a, a really funny video, and I'll show it to you, uh, it, which probably looked about like me trying to teach this thing. It's confusing. Because you're like chasing this over here and that's over there and this is over here and class golf and class and below. Th I had no idea how to organize this. Within the first year, I put together a, a, a chart that was similar to this. This is the, I haven't changed this one in a long, long time. In fact, I've found this one on the internet too. I've seen the exact same thing on the internet. But when I was putting this thing together, I just wanted to make it something where let's put a common sense approach to it. So class alpha on top and then go down the alphabet. And then these are kind of easy and that one is also the very part, the very top one is standard, so easy. This one was an exception and it also tied into class golf. And then the other parts of class golf was either day or night and only one could be clear of clouds. So this is how you can memorize and, and, and know for each type of operation that you're conducting, what your minimum condition requirements are because you have to you have to maintain this okay and some of this means that I'm gonna be all out on my own there's no ATC here there's no one telling me what I'm supposed to do here if you're flying with an instructor or a check airman or the administrator or designated pilot examiner well, you better believe someone's going to pay attention if you're not flying uh, how you should. So that means if you're flying class echo, and this is on an assessment flight or an evaluation flight, someone's there to evaluate you, and you fly right into a cloud, excuse me, what did you just do? Why did you do that? Ah, it was just a little cloud. No. You just broke the rules. That's what you just did, right? So don't do it. Same thing with class golf. Sometimes, and this is tremendously useful uh, if I'm trying to maximize my availability to use that airplane. So during the winter months, and you guys are here at a nice time, anytime from March until November, we have thunderstorms and rain all day, every day. It's just middle of the daytime you're gonna have. This last year wasn't too bad. It was actually kind of mild. In the winter time, you know, where we are now until February, beginning of March, we'll have some days where there's very, very low visibility. N nice, nice day. Because usually it's very smooth, tremendously smooth. But I can't see very well at all. So I might get a special VFR clearance out of class Delta airspace. I might go to another airport, Airglades or uh, uh, Pahokee or Okeechobee, and I could operate there in class golf airspace with just one statute mile visibility. And I have maybe some you know, clouds in the area, but we're gonna stay out of those clouds. Beautiful flying, very, very smooth. We'll see when we start getting into the weather what that looks like. But I have to know the rules so that I can fly within accordance to the rules. Okay, a couple other different types of airspace. So we did airspace classification, uncontrolled, controlled, Echo, Delta, Charlie, Bravo, Alpha, special VFR. Uh, special VFR means that although I may require, let's say for instance I'm flying in class Delta and I, I went a little fast on that special VFR part. So class Delta, we're here, Fort Lauderdale Executive. Remember I said in the winter time, sometimes the visibility is very low, but the these, these air is very smooth. This is a nice day to fly. If I try to call Fort Lauderdale Executive Clearance and I say, hey, look, this is uh, uh, 08 Juliet, 5208 Juliet. I have information, echo, and I request uh, VFR traffic patterns. If I don't have at least three statute miles visibility, clearance is going to tell me unable. And that's it. 
and they won't say anything else to me. Unable? What do you mean unable? <laughs> right? VFR conditions don't exist. That's why. If I don't have VFR conditions, they cannot clear me into this airspace. That's executive clearance, right? I'm talking to them, telling them what my plan is, so I can taxi out to the runway and then talk to local and they can put me in the air. So I don't have three statute miles visibility. What else is happening on the airport that day regarding lighting? So they turn the light? So beacon, uh... The rotating beacon is on. Right? So I got the rotating beacon on. I have less than three statute mile visibility. I called clearance. They tell me unable. ATC cannot ask me and they cannot initiate a special VFR clearance. I can as a pilot and as a flight instructor I will. I'll say I'm requesting a special VFR clearance. Oh well then 5208 Juliet contact ground. Just that easy. They can't tell me, they can't say, hey, 5208 Juliet, I can't clear you for traffic pattern, but would you like to have a special VFR clearance? They won't say that. If I don't know about it, they're going to act like they don't know about it. But as soon as I tell them I request special VFR, certainly, contact, contact ground and taxi. Who has endorsement for special VFR? Or it's not required. Uh, so for special, here's the problem. The requirements for a student pilot are that you have to be VFR. So basic VFR, you can't, if it's three statute miles outside, student pilots generally don't want to fly. You guys would probably be okay because you've flown many hundreds of hours in conditions that are similar to, that's fine. But for the student pilot who's learning how to fly, they're not gonna be out there in three statute miles. So usually private pilot, instrument commercial, these flight instructor, now you'll have your special VFR clearance. Special VFR clearance allows me to enter controlled airspace with reduced visibility. That reduced visibility is typically one statute mile and clear of clouds. So that's what I could do a special VFR. For uh, any, any type of Unless it's placard, or placarded, unless it's uh, noted that they can't, like Miami has no special VFR listed on it. Yeah. So it, it is uh, not authorized at some airports. Okay, special use airspace. Here's an example of some special use airspace. Prohibited, restricted, or warning. Alert areas. Military operation areas. I'm going to come back to this slide, but just going through some of the other ones, you also have military training routes. Okay. Prohibited, the PAPA 5-6. Restricted, R6401. Or warning area, Whiskey 518. A couple of different uh, special use airspaces. I also could have an alert area. And you see it has a very similar cross-hatched area that it's depicted by. Military operations area, MOA, the Vance 2, or this is the Avon Park 1, or Avon Park West, or whatever they may name this thing. They usually give MOAs a name. Let's talk through some of these things because the airspace here in the United States will get a little tricky. And it's not a bad idea to approach these with the better safe than sorry mentality. It really is. Problem is that sometimes for you to operate the way that you want to, you need to know the rules. And you need to know how those rules affect you. A good example of this is a scenario. If you're given a scenario to take off and fly from Fort Lauderdale Executive to uh, Orlando Executive, and I'll pull it up on my four flight here in just a second, you'll see that there's a, a, just an expansive area of military operations and restricted areas along my route of flight. It, I might want to say, okay, I'm going to stay away from that completely. Well, at least you knew that it was there. 
because a lot of pilots make a flight plan, they don't even know it's there. And they fly right through the stuff and they don't even know it's there. And it could be active, okay? That happens. Not a good practice. For you to say that I'm gonna stay completely away from it, okay. But if you're given a scenario, for instance, a scenario in a check ride, and he's asking, what if I wanted to? You got to give him the answer. The answer is either, yes, I can go, or no, I cannot go. Not, yes, I would go, or no, I just do not want to go. Right? You get one or the other. Hey there. Popular place today. Okay. So, prohibited areas. What does that mean? It means I cannot fly in it. It is exactly what it says. Prohibited. There's an area surrounding our nation's capital that's prohibited. The, the risk is very high in that area. So meaning that, let's put it from a pilot and command perspective, what, what do I have at stake if I accidentally fly into a prohibited area? Well, outside of that prohibited area and contained within the prohibited area are uh, Avenger surface-to-air missile systems, <laughs> okay? There are actual missiles. You guys seen what happened with the uh, Ukrainian airplane in Iran, right? Well, we have that stuff set up. And if it becomes a threat and is identified as a threat within the prohibited area, that exact scenario will happen here. Uh, I don't know. Whatever your thoughts are on the Iranian thing, ah. Uh, but it could happen here if a pilot went in a prohibited area, okay? Restricted area. A restricted area is not prohibited, okay? It says right here, restricted area is airspace defined under 14 Code of Federal Regulations, Part 73 provisions, airspace, within which the flight of aircraft, while not wholly prohibited, is subject to restriction. So what do I find in a restricted area? I find operations or hazards that could be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. Some of the restricted area, the restricted area you see on your way to Orlando, these are missile areas. These are ordnance areas. This is where the Department of Defense practices Target shooting practices its gunnery, whether it's artillery systems, ground-based systems, air-based systems, whatever it is, air systems, whatever. So I have some hazards. Another area that's restricted is the area right over there by Key West. Anybody taking a look at the area by Key West? What do we got over there? Uh, we, uh, we went there um, one month ago. Okay. Like, yes, and they have a very small yes, area. What's inside that? Uh, I, I, I don't know. There's a balloon, yeah, balloon yeah. with a cable that could go up to 14,000 feet, whatever, okay? That balloon is a weather balloon. It's not a weather balloon. It has observation cameras in it. It's how we take a look at Fidel and his brother, whoever the Castro is down there in Cuba. We can see them from that, from that observation balloon, okay? That's early warning detection systems for another special use airspace called the ADIS. <laughs> okay. All right. So working through the rest of these, restricted area means, hey, I'm not, I'm not prohibited from going in there. In other words, if I went into that restricted area that we're discussing about over near Key West, who cares? Nobody's going to shoot me down. If I fly into that cable, I'm going to fall down myself, right? And airplanes have flown into it. If I'm flying through a restricted zone and the Department of Defense is conducting gunnery operations and missile operations or artillery, machine gun operations, whatever, who cares? They're not going to shoot me down on purpose, but if I get shot down, I, I had no reason to be there. Right? That belonged to them. Okay? So restricted area, it's a... Uh, hmm. It's an interesting discussion because I can fly through there, I can fly through there if it's inactive, certainly, because it doesn't even exist then. I can fly through there if it's active, but not a smart idea because I could cause myself some harm. 
So I probably would prefer to have uh, a clearance through that area or instructions, uh, permission to go through that area. Not required, but better. Warning areas. What in the world are the warning areas? Okay, well, not too, not. The warning areas means that I could find aircraft in excess of 250 knots. Now they say aircraft. Until they build a helicopter that's going to go faster than 250, which we haven't done that yet. Until they do that, we're going to call them airplanes. <coughs> so it's airplanes in excess of 250 knots. That's what you'll find in a warning area. That's also what you'll find here in the military training routes. Anybody crossed the military training route before? No. Of course you have. You do that all the time. There's no reason not to. We see these things everywhere. It is, in all intents and purposes, doesn't even exist. But I could find airplanes that are in excess of 250 knots below 10,000 feet there. Same thing with your military operations area. On that MOA, I could find airplanes that are in excess of 250 knots. I could find an airplane that does not have an operating transponder because they're flying in a flight of airplanes. So I have whichever type of airplanes that are there could be not detectable by radar. Maybe I don't have any radar environment, any kind of radar that can detect this thing. So the MOA is designed as uh, a separation of IFR aircraft from certain military operations. That's really what that is. It's to separate IFR from all types of military operations. Could I cross into this if I didn't have a clearance? Yep. Can I do it if there is active military operations? Yep. Could I do it if it's not active? Well, of course, then it doesn't even exist, really. Okay. And also, if I take a look at that chart, it's a two-dimensional chart. So on that two-dimensional chart, keep in mind that I see no altitude. I have to look at the legend to find out what altitude does this thing start? What altitude does it stop? For the prohibited, the restricted, the warning areas, the MOAs, anything in the world. For alert areas, can I fly into that? <laughs> of course. What does it tell me? Well, there's a lot of, a lot of student solo practice training going on right there. Right? Stay away. All right, fine. So where else am I going to go? Everywhere else all around that. It's just a couple of training areas. Some flight schools, I tell you, one flight school in particular, a very large flight school that's well known, Embry-Riddle, requires its students and for some operations requires its instructors to remain within the boundaries of their training areas. So of course you got concentrated student flying there. That's fine. We got a couple of them here. We got Alpha 290, what is it, 291 Alpha, which is over there by the Coral Springs practice area. And oh, don't get me started on the frequency 123.45. Because that's actually, that's an air rink frequency for air carriers. And they communicate back and forth. They use it out here in the Coral Springs training area. Hey, Coral Springs practice area, I'm over the Everglades and the trailer park. And they, less pilots know where they are on that frequency than anything else. And those that do know where they are probably aren't talking English. You know, they're out there, and it's not Russian. I don't even know what all it is. 18 different kind of languages out there on that frequency, okay? So who knows what in the world, but it's not a requirement. Anyways, it doesn't say I have to have any kind of special uh, uh, frequency on when I'm flying through that alert area. Okay, there's the military training route. And like I said, I will show this let's see if I can get this is a pretty good chart here there it is and zoom in zoom in zoom in a little bit more Okay. There 
There we go. This is your spot. Like I was talking earlier, we're going to fly from Fort Lauderdale Executive and come up to Orlando, somewhere vicinity, Disney World, and all these vacation areas. Okay, that's fine and fun and dandy. Look at all the airspace you got in the way. Plenty of it. So I've got MOAs, another MOA. I got a line of restricted airspace here in the middle. Another MOA. All these different restricted airspaces have different, uh, different restrictions, right? different altitudes, different effective times, all sorts of stuff. So if I want to find that information, the only way I could do that is by looking in the legend. Look in the legend. Find out what those, what those uh, characteristics of that airspace are, effective times when they're normally effective, the controlling agency, the altitudes, and then see, do my proposed operations interfere with any of this uh, airspace? If I'm flying below 7,000 feet, typically no, unless I'm flying near the restricted. So restricted airspace usually is restricted to the surface or from the surface to a higher altitude because there's some sort of gunnery going on, some sort of uh, air to surface or surface to surface gunnery or missiles that's going on there. That's your restricted airspace near a DOD. Coming up here, if I go to this, there's another restricted airspace, right? R2916, the one we're talking about. And what is that? There it is. Mm-hmm. Unmarked balloon on cable to 14,000 feet. What kind of airspace is this? We went over this one earlier, didn't we? Just kind of check on learning. What is all that? Wildlife. Yes, exactly. 2,000 feet and above. How in the world am I going to stay 2,000 feet and above? Well, easy. As I approach Key West, let's do that from the south. And usually that's the way we do. We come in from the south. Not to go over near the dry Tortugas or none of that stuff. They fly float planes over here, which is kind of a nice little vacation spot or a tourist trap anyways. From what I understand, this is a neat little chain of islands. And they fly a float plane over there. They drop you off and you can see a fort and all sorts of different things. On the way out of Key West, typically speaking, pilots will make a left turn off runway niner and then climb over this, but mm, you're not in 2,000 feet very long. Not supposed to meander or linger around these national wildlife refuges below 2,000 feet. Okay, so that is example. Let me go through here and get that thing going. And get this going. And that concludes exactly to the T, ground lesson four. I have a question. Yes, sir. So, uh, what does it mean? VFR flyways, VFR corridors, and uh, VFR transition routes. So, when I have those... VFR corridors, usually it implies some sort of airspeed restriction. I may be restricted to 200 knots. Uh, a VFR uh, corridor extends through Class Bravo, for instance. It'll allow me to fly from one side of Los Angeles to the other side of Los Angeles without ever getting a clearance because I have Class Echo airspace but I have to fly a, a very specific lateral boundary and then altitude boundary. And through that, I may have an airspeed restriction of 200 knots. Fine. Flyways are, if you look near the uh, Pensacola and Tyndall Air Force Base area, they'll have some flyways that allow us to go from Mississippi, Alabama to the Gulf of Mexico without interfering with their wide, expansive, restricted, and MOA areas. So I can fly without interfering with any of those intercept airplanes and bombers and any uh, refuelers, everything else that they have. 
I can fly from the north to the south. That's a flyway. And it's depicted on the VFR charts with just an, an arrow up or an arrow down showing you which direction that you'd fly. Very, very congested airspace, but allows freedom of movement for VFR traffic because not everybody's on an IFR flight plan. From the surface to some level. To, from the surface to some, it, it, usually it's a very, very low altitude. Yep. But it's just restrictions uh, on uh, specified lateral and altitude boundaries and, uh, and, and airspeeds. But great question. And transition route, a transition route requires 